Yeah. Okay. So much for that. Sorry, guys. I haven't been in the gym in a while. That's why my muscles, they're gone again. Hopefully, I'll get back into the routine of things and start working out and get healthy. Welcome, everyone, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Friday, Niles. Guys, guess what? I usually wait a few more minutes for more of the regulars to show up, but I know, you know, that takes a lot more time than to get into the topic. The Quran says there are two Norths and two Souths. Ah, ah, ah. Carly, what's up? What's up, Carly? What's up? What it is? What is it? What it be like? Carly, were you the sister that was saying you're not attacking? I guess you misunderstood my use of attack. I use attack <clears throat> in a broader sense, not meaning personally just attacking or insulting or belittling. Attacking mean, means also, in my vocabulary, criticizing a position, right? So sometimes I got to choose my words carefully because people don't define terms the way I do. I'm going to start a Sam Shamoon, Sam Shamoon dictionary. Yeah, I don't know. Someone in my comment section. Yeah, it's, it's not you. I'm sorry. I couldn't say because see the, your, your pictures. I'm looking at your, what, what do they call them? You know, the picture that identifies you, your account, right? What do they call that? Icon, your icon. Is that it? Icon. No, I can't, friend. I can't do that. Avatar. The avatar. I see. The icon. Okay. Because in my Mac, it's a small Mac. So your icon, your av avatar, 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 very small. So I can't see. I'd have to enlarge it for me to get a better view of who's who. Horton, here's a who. What's up, Ortho Rocco? Ibobo Rojo. All right. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be in love with you perfectly and unconditionally. To be in love with Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit perfectly, completely, and unconditionally. To be in love with the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, Father, the Spirit of your Son, the Lord Jesus. To love the Spirit perfectly, unconditionally. And Father, have mercy on us. Save us, Father, from our flesh. Save us from our moral failures. By the power of the Holy Spirit, cleanse us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> by the blood of his cross, he has reconciled us to you, Father. Cover us by the blood of Jesus, even our loved ones, my daughters. Shield them, shield every one of us by the power of the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, that gives us victory over Satan, over sin, over <clears throat> this fallen world, and victory over our flesh. Crucify our flesh, Father. Mortify our flesh, Father. Save us from the stain the influence and the fruits of the flesh and fill us with your Holy Spirit, life from your spirit, power from your spirit, fruit from your spirit, Father. And help us, Lord, to be holy unto you <clears throat> because without holiness, no one can see your face, Father. And clothe us with the Lord Jesus Christ, with his righteousness, with his holiness. <clears throat> Unite us to Jesus forever, Father. And by your power, <clears throat> make our hearts the everlasting throne of your beloved son, the Lord Jesus. Make the, the hearts of my daughters the everlasting throne of your son, the Lord Jesus, even the heart of their mother. Take her captive for the glory of Jesus, every one of us, Father. Save us from attacks of the enemy. Save us from confusion and stammering. Save me from error and misinterpretation, Father. Save me from being unnecessarily offensive, Father. Give me victory over my weaknesses and my moral failures, Father. To be more patient, and I beg you, Father, please... Have mercy on us, compassion on us, have patience with us, Father, and give us the grace to be patient with one another for your sake, Father, for the sake of the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life and give me the health I need to serve you, Father, the holiness to delight your heart. Bless everyone with eyes to see and ears to hear. Illuminate them by the power of the Holy Spirit and fill them, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make us more like Jesus and help us to love you. We love you, Abba. Lord Jesus, we love you. We adore you, Son of God. And we love you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, take over the session, please, and have your way with us and fill us with your presence. Fill us with yourself, Holy Spirit. May we decrease and save us from ourselves and save my daughters for the glory of Jesus. We thank you. We love you. We worship you. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Nisi, Yahovah Shalom, Yahovah Yira, in Jesus' name. 
In Jesus' name, now the Lord's prayer. Amen, amen. All right, guys. I pray the Lord Jesus beatify me with his beauty and his holiness and the light of Christ shine through me and through all of you, not just me. Guys, how did you enjoy the session last night? Those of you who are listening, right? Those of you who were listening last night or went back and listened to it when it was archived. Yeah, yeah sorry. I don't know why it's buffering here. It's in Child of God's home. The internet connection is much, much better, but... Blacksmith, you didn't come back, bro. When YouTube shut down the live streams, I came back 20 minutes later and Blacksmith was nowhere to be found. What's up, bro? You were nowhere to be found. Right? You disappeared on me, player. But yeah, those of you who were able to join last night and listen to the live stream, the second part, or those of you who listened later on, Thank the Lord Jesus for the power and the wisdom that comes from a spirit. We were able to go very deep, in depth, into the background of John chapter 1, right? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on a second. We got a demon again. about that we got a demon we got demons attacking the deity of the lord jesus christ <sighs> yeah have mercy lord sorry about that folks i don't mean to be distracted but that's what happens when it live streams all right folks yeah i my focus zena god bless you sister i don't know if you guys know this is a young sister who's on fire for jesus She's got two brothers who are also on fire and hungry for Jesus. So can you pray for Zena, her two brothers? Choose Jesus and Razzle and their family that Jesus Christ will just fill them with his love, his peace and joy and seal them by the spirit. She's a faithful follower. Even though she sees my issues, I got serious issues. She puts up with me for the sake of Christ. So praise the Lord Jesus for her. Yeah, my focus, Zena, let me just emphasize something. Among the apologists that I work with, we all have a particular area where we specialize in by the power of the Holy Spirit. As you can see, vocab specializes in black Hebrew Israelites. John, what do you mean, McCray? His, his specialty would be also reaching <clears throat> atheists, secul secularism, dealing with those issues that plague <clears throat> teenagers and young adults who are heading off to college, right, and being indoctrinated into socialism or secularism or atheism right david wood you know his specialty forte is islam and then atheism anthony rogers an expert at dismantling islam i would say among the apologists anthony rogers right among the apologists anthony rogers and myself like to focus more on the core doctrines of the christian faith he has a passion to teach Christians about the biblical basis for the core doctrines of the Christian faith, the Trinity, Jesus Christ being God Almighty who became man, two natures, one person, the inspiration of Scripture, sola gratia, we're saved by grace alone. And like me, because we come from a Protestant heritage, sola fide, we're justified by faith alone apart from works that we do, <clears throat> saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. So he's passionate to share with Christians the definitional doctrines of christianity my passion is similar the reason why is because again let me remind you why i spend 90 percent maybe even 95 percent maybe even more than that it's probably 99 percent. i haven't looked at all the videos i've done all the sessions i've done and calculated but i wouldn't be surprised if it's over 95 percent of the talks i've done even over 90 percent of my articles Focus on explaining and defending by the grace of God's spirit the core doctrines of the Christian faith. And let me remind you why. Let me remind you why. My introduction to Islam wasn't by a Muslim who was loving and peaceful and kind and just shared with me the beauty of Islam. He didn't tell me about the scientific miracles of the Quran or how what a wonderful human being Muhammad was. He was a role model. 
my introduction to Islam was <clears throat> to be attacked by Muslim apologists, mocking me, ridiculing me, disgracing me, and pointing to so many alleged errors in the Bible and passages that he tried to use to prove that Jesus can't be God. So my introduction, introduction to Islam wasn't a pleasant one. I was introduced to a Muslim apologist who was very nasty, rude, right, an arrogant jerk. This is why if you see my approach, this is why you see I go for the juggler. You have some apologists, they're very kind, they're very loving and patient. But if you notice my approach, I go for the juggler. I'm all too willing to just decimate and annihilate someone and crush him. And even if I have to humiliate him to show him, to expose him for the blasphemous fool that he is, because that's what a Muslim did to me. Right? That was my introduction to Islam. A Muslim humiliated me, disgraced me, mocked my faith, mocked my Jesus. So that created a monster. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will sanctify this monster to become more like Jesus and not anger the Lord. Right? So this is why my approach is different and why my focus happens to be on spending more time explaining the core doctrines of the Christian faith than criticizing Islam because he attacked my faith. So even if I refute Islam, that doesn't mean Christianity is true. Even if I show Muhammad is a false prophet, and he is, and a son of Satan, and he is, use of the devil, and he is, and a moral monster, and he is, he's all that. And he's under the feet of Jesus, under the wrath of Jesus Christ. Okay, And he will stand before Jesus and bow before the feet of Jesus, that he's not worthy to kiss. Okay, That still doesn't mean the Trinity is true or the Bible is the word of God. Islam can be false, and so can Christianity. And maybe Buddhism is true. So here's another thing. Just because you refute one religion, or you refute one worldview, or you refute atheism and show it's irrational, and it's not scientific, and the facts do not support atheism, that doesn't mean Christianity is automatically true. You with me there? I just want to clarify that because of what Zena said. Why I spend over 90% of my time focusing on explaining the Holy Bible, trusting the Holy Spirit to enable me and qualify me to do so without error for the glory of Jesus. Right? This is why. Because my faith was attacked. And my passion was to find answers to those objections against the Christian faith. Now, with that said, another reason why it's important to be able to demonstrate that these core definitional doctrines held by the church historically, such as the Trinity or Christ is the God-man, why it's important to be able to establish that biblically? Because even if you prove the Holy Bible is God's word, that doesn't mean the Trinity is true. It may mean Joe's witnesses are right because they're interpreting the Bible correctly. You see what I'm getting at? The Bible can be true and still God not be a Trinity. The Bible can be true and still Jesus not be God. In other words, just because the Bible is true, historically accurate and inspired, doesn't mean that the doctrine of the Trinity is true. This is why you then have to be able, enabled, empowered by the Spirit to show from the Scriptures that these Scriptures, which we know to be historically accurate and inspired by God, God's voice to His church, do teach that the God who revealed this book is triune. Right? Is that clear? Is that clear? Guys, pray. We got to we gotta sooner than later make it to 200. Because my goal is to get 900 for my live streams so I can blow David Wood out of the water. Hater Wood. Right? Hater Wood. And be the best looking apologist on YouTube. I don't know if that's going to happen. Hold on, guys. I don't know if that's going to happen. Hold on. Just don't hate, guys. Don't hate. Participate. All right. Sorry about that, folks. Hold on. I stand down. Lay me on a river. When it's in no, no. Sorry about that. Some issues that I got to deal with. You guys all right? Y'all good? Y'all good in the hood? Yeah, that's what it is, Carly. I'm fighting to get it to 200 slowly to 900. And even when I get 200, I only get 80 likes out of 200. It's just people don't like me. They love to hate me. It's a love-hate relationship. They love to hate me, Carly. They love to hate me, 
and they just come here to see me lose my testimony so I can say, see, <laughs> fake Christian, I don't see Jesus in you. <laughs> yeah. Man, do I hate my facial expressions. Right? Anyway, with that said, let's begin. I want to do a final session on John 1. Exactly, Jonathan Simon. This will, Hopefully, this will be my final session on John 1 for now until we go through, if God permits, the Lord Jesus enables me and qualifies me to be able to do it. We go through book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because when I do that, Lord willing, I do want to start with the Gospel of John. And we'll be doing a lot of cross-referencing. I'll take a chapter of John, try to break it down, and tie it in with other books of the Bible as Holy Spirit leads the sessions for the glory of Jesus Christ. And finish the other series I began. I began series on Jehovah's Witnesses and how to use their Bible to prove the historic doctrines of the Christian faith. And Jesus is not the Archangel Michael. We're going to get into all that, God willing. And good news, folks. I got internet for my apartment today. I got internet. God willing, I want to now learn how to schedule my talks in advance. So if I'm going to do a talk tomorrow, I will schedule it and say, What's the day today? February what? 21st? February 21st. I'll set it up. February 22nd, 8 p.m. Sam goes live. So that'll give you at least one day notice so we can get more people to join us and to worship Jesus Christ with us. Now, oh, thank you, Anna. God bless you, sister. With that said, guys, is first and last here? I just gave that as an example medic don't worry about it doesn't mean eight o'clock i'll do it i'll do it three in the morning my time would that be okay guys in jesus name do take a moment to pray first and last his back is out so he's bedridden so we again ask that jesus rafa yeshua rafa jehovah rafa father son and spirit the lord jesus the father's son will will speak healing to first and the last back that the holy spirit of life <clears throat> will bless first and last and speak life <clears throat> into his back. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, by your stripes we are healed. By your wounds we are healed. Healed physically and emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Heal him, Lord Jesus, for your glory. Raise him up with, with perfect strength in his back. <clears throat> Strengthening it by your spirit, Lord Jesus, the spirit of your Father. And I pray that for all of us, Lord Jesus, any one of us, that is hurting now, whether physically, Lord Jesus, whether emotionally, mentally, spiritually, or our loved ones, Lord Jesus, whatever the ailment may be, by your blood, Lord Jesus, you purchase the redemption of our whole beings, our bodies, our minds, our souls, our spirits, Lord Jesus. So give us a foretaste now of what's to come when you end this wicked, evil system and in glory when you return physically to usher in that new age where there'll be no more death, no more pain, no more disease, no more corruption, where you'll transform us to become morally incorruptible and physically indestructible. Give us a fortune. Come to them, Lord Jesus, in a mighty way and love them as only you can. In my case, my daughters, Lord Jesus, remind them of your love and I love them in Jesus' name. So again, just wanted to take a moment to pray for this brother because he has been a blessing to me as Protestant believer has been a blessing to me. Right. So with that said, let's unpack John 1 a little further and I'll be done with John 1 for now. I'll be done with John 1 for now because you did ask me when I was discussing Joe's witnesses and their perverted Bible and how to use their perverted Bible to point to the truth of the historic Christian faith. When I brought up the idea of unpacking John chapter 1. You guys are on board, so hopefully this will be the final session for now. A little more meat in John 1. And by the way, some people some people ask me questions on topics I've already addressed. Guys, it makes me want to lose my testimony. Okay. Guys, you do yourselves a disservice. You guys do yourself a disservice. When you don't go back into the archive of my YouTube channel, right, and watch the sessions I started doing about two years ago, and you guys do yourself a disservice when you don't go to my blog and use the search engine or go to answeringislam.net 
which is the website that I began writing for in 1999, looking for the answers to questions I've already addressed not once, but a dozen times, if not more. So guys, instead of being lazy, and I'm going to say you guys are being lazy, and asking me a question, search the YouTube channel or go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, use the search engine, or go to answeringislam.net and look up the two links to my two pages there because I have nearly 200, if not more, articles where I have addressed the common objections raised by anti-Trinitarians and Muslims against the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ. For example, my precious brother, Daryl Nutt, right? <clears throat> What's that commercial? Sometimes it feels like a nut, sometimes it don't. He asked me, how do you respond to someone who brings up John 17, 21 when you quote John 10, 30? And I wanted to go, oh, sigh. Do you know why? Because just about several weeks ago, in one of my sessions, I even brought, raised John 17, 21 in my exposition of John 10, 30. It was in a session where I spent about two hours saying, here's how you don't prove the deity of Christ. Quoting John 10, 30, where it says, I am the Father one, because they're going to quote to you John 17, 11, and 21 and 23, specifically 21 and 22. So this is how you respond. By looking at the context of John 10, 30, starting at 27. And what does my brother do? Who's a nut? But he's Daryl Nut. He asked me the same question that I addressed about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Right? And then another brother here came here and asked me about David and David having a Lord that's bigger than him. I just did, not too long ago, maybe less than three months ago. Right? And I have half a dozen articles on David calling Messiah Jesus his Lord in Psalm 110. Okay? What's my point? Folks, please, we got to stop being lazy. And I am lazy. I'm lazy, and I ask God to save me from my laziness. We got to stop being lazy. Use the search engine. Peruse the YouTube channel or my blogs or the website, answeringislam.net, and I promise you they're there. Because if I keep answering the same question that's being asked by different people over and over again, addressing, if I keep addressing the same questions asked by different people, I'll never be able to move on to other topics. I won't. Why do you think there's an archive YouTube channel? It archives our live, live streams. So you can go back and listen to the sessions and find that maybe one of those sessions addressed that objection, right? Or you go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, search, and there you go. There's one, maybe more than one article on that particular objection or misinterpretation of that specific verse and answeringislam.net, right? Thank you, Protestant believer. The Lord Jesus bless you. And I know OMG means, oh my gosh. God bless you for serving us for the sake of Jesus and helping me beatify the YouTube chain uh, channel for the glory of Christ. I like that. He goes, oh my gosh. We don't say, oh my God. Oh my gosh. The meat in all his videos. Thank you, brother. Because you can look at me. I'm a meat eater. I'm not vegan. I love meat. Joe Glenn Davies. Do you see what the title of my session is? Even though I put exclamation mark instead of one, I'm going to have to edit it later. Is it, yo, Sam, why am I King James only? Or is it understanding John 1, 1 and its Trinitarian implications? Thank you, Anna. She just gave you a way of getting it. Who's pontificating? I am. Am I pontificating, Joe Glenn Davies? You're killing me, brother. I thought you were regular here. Hold on. I like that. Who's pontificating, bro? You are, bro? You even know my, you know what, Joel? We're going to come up with the Sam dictionary because you guys are learning my uh, lingo, pontificating. We're going to come up with a dictionary of Sam's most commonly used verbs, adverbs, adjectives, nouns, and pronouns. And then we're going to come up with shirts. I've been blocked by Sam Shimon or Halal Hogan, and I'll become a millionaire and I'll fully support my ministry. Joel, Lord willing, maybe I can answer that question in a future session. 
See, you tempted me to answer that question, brother. Uh, send Tom and Jerry to Woody Woodpecker because we don't want barking, rabid, satanic dogs here. So Tom and Jerry, say hi to Woody Woodpecker. And while you're at it, you know, have a can of spinach with Popeye. Okay. 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 You asked me a good question, and I don't want to answer that now because I'm tempted. But, guys, can you remind me, not when I'm about to end the session, 10 minutes before the session is over, to give you links to Theodore Letus. I used to pronounce his last name Letus because it's L-E-T-I-S, but it's Letus. Theodore Letus, who passed away tragically in a car accident, tragically for us because we lost him, but now he's in glory dwelling before the feet of Jesus Christ, more alive than us, right? But this man was, in my estimation, one of the best committed evangelical Trinitarian scholars to the authority and preservation of the Holy Bible. He was a wealth of information and knowledge. And there is a YouTube channel where you'll find some of his lectures. Some are video, some are audio where he goes in-depth in modern textual criticism and he exposes the agendas, right, <clears throat> the beliefs of many of these textual critics showing that a lot of them do not believe in God, and if they do, they're very liberal, do not believe the Bible is the word of God. And he also demonstrates how, due to the rise of textual criticism and due to <clears throat> questioning some of these passages that for centuries people took for granted were God's inspired words, but which, which modern textual critics called into question based on some of the earlier manuscripts led to many people losing their faith in the Trinity. Theodore Letus, or Letus, I keep saying Letus, it's Letus, L-E-T-I-S. In fact, here, let me give you one link. I hope I'm not boring you guys because I want to go into the topic. I believe that's the link. Let me see. In this talk that he did, early 2000, let me see if that's it. Yes. In this talk that he did, I was blown away by the depth of this man's knowledge when it comes to the transmission of God's word, the textual variance, and the people <clears throat> behind the science of modern textual criticism. You have to listen to this talk. And then when you go to that link, subscribe to that channel and listen to the rest of the talks that are available on that channel. Here's the link again. Theodore Letus. I used to pronounce it Letus. It's Letus. L-E-T-I-S. Unbeknownst to me until I listened to this lecture, some of the people that ended up denying the Trinity did so because of certain readings that were called into question. Guys, can I take a moment to explain what I mean? What do I mean certain readings? Certain readings that were called into question whether they were originally part of what the authors wrote down by inspiration. He mentions Sir Isaac Newton. And I knew this a while back. A while back, I don't know why it's buffering, but it's upsetting me. Buffering makes me want to lose my testimony so I can't have a reason to repent. Anyway, I had learned a while back, a while back, Sir Isaac Newton, though he's considered the father of modern you know, physics, he was also a very devout Bible student, and he wrote a lot on Bible prophecy, but he was an anti-Trinitarian. Did you guys know that? He was an anti-Trinitarian. Sir Isaac Newton was not simply a non-Trinitarian. He was an anti-Trinitarian who opposed the Trinity and attacked it as a false doctrine and not a biblical truth. He also wrote, I don't want to call it a monograph, right? He wrote a book, right, about two readings that are found in the King James Version, but which textual criticism calls into question. In the King James Version, you'll find 1 John 5, 7 and 1 Timothy 3, 16, 
affirming the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Okay? Let me show you. King James, 1 John 5, 7. You guys, can I take a few moments just to talk about this? It's actually, I don't think it's live. Acts 17 Apologetics, it's a premiere. Vocab had all these different YouTube channels, including mine, where he's... He, each channel will be scheduled at a certain time to promote something. So my channel is going to promote on behalf of Vocab Malone and his channel at 8 p.m. my time, which is 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I don't know what's happening, what's going to be playing on David Wood's channel or my channel. I don't know. But I know Protestant Believer knows a little more than I do about that. Anyway, 1 John 5, 7, King James. Are you guys listening? 1 John 5, verse 7, King James. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Word. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay? 1 John 5, 7. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. These three are one. What three? Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. What are they? One. Okay. That's King James. Now, 1 Timothy 3, 16, King James. Yeah, so if you guys want to hear about black Hebrew Israelites, go ahead, man. What happened? I was over 100. Now we're down. Come on, guys. Hit that like button. Stop making me cry. I don't want to be begging you. I only beg Jesus. 1 Timothy 3.16 in the King James Version. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was manifest in the flesh? Who appeared in flesh? God, Theos, manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up into glory. Okay. Now, let's compare these two verses in a modern version. Let's compare how these two passages read in the NIV. Protestant believer, can you post the NIV? Start with 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16, NIV. Right? Sorry. Sorry about that. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Don't forget, that's how King James reads. God, the Greek word theos, was manifest in the flesh. Now, let's see how the NIV reads. Okay, watch here. NIV, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godless springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. Where's the word God, folks? Where's the word God? The debate is, did Paul originally write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Theos? Theos? What's going on here? Sorry about that. How do I get out of here? What's going on? Oh, boy. I don't know what's going on with the internet, folks. I don't understand it. Why it's messing up, and right now I lost the comments. Oh my goodness, yeah, man, life. Okay, guys, can you comment? Yep, I don't know what's happening, man. In Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, please destroy all distractions of Satan, rebuke the evil one, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, Lord, please, for your glory. Let's see. Oops, nope, that's not it. Oops, I did it again. Hold on, man. I don't know what's going on. Shh, boy. These technical issues. Okay, now we got it. everything good. Could you hear me? Were we going all right? Okay, so the debate is the debate is between did Paul originally write under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Haas, which means who, or did he originally write Theos, God? God was manifest in the flesh. See, that's the debate. The King James, based on the received text, right, which comes out of the family of manuscripts called the majority text, the Byzantine text, says God was manifest in the flesh, right? But some of our earlier Greek copies, as well as some of our <clears throat> translations, versions of the New Testament and various languages, do not say theos, God. They say who, Greek, Greek word has which is who, right? 
So you see, you, you understand what you just saw. This is something common knowledge to people in the field of textual criticism or people who are avid students of Bible versions. If you are an avid Bible reader and you collect Bible versions and you study these versions studiously and carefully, you already know this information. Most people are not avid students of the Bible and don't read their Bible carefully if they read it at all. So they don't catch these differences. Right? Can you guys hear me? So I want to make sure you're hearing me. They don't catch these differences. Anybody there? Good. Okay, I didn't think. Okay, now. So because of science of textual criticism and because of the work of textual criticism starting with Erasmus and his annotations, Sir Isaac Newton discovered that 1 Timothy 3.16 shouldn't read God was manifest in the flesh, but the original reading as far as he understood it, because he was persuaded by textual critics that it originally said he was manifest in the flesh, not God was manifest in the flesh. What about 1 John 5, 7? What about 1 John 5, 7? You read in the King James. The King James says there are three heavenly witnesses. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Let's see how it reads in the NIV. 1 John 5, 7 in the NIV. And we're going to go back to John. I pray that the Holy Spirit is guiding this conversation, and I'm trusting in you, Holy Spirit, to save me from error and bless your people to get excited about the word that you produce and how you preserved it for the glory of Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I really don't want to bore you guys, torture you guys with this stuff. It's stuff you need to know because you guys are serious Bible students. If you are not serious Bible students, you wouldn't be here. You're not here for entertainment. You're here because you want me and you're trusting the Holy Spirit to enable me to give you meat so that we can all feast at the table of the Lord Jesus together, right? So we're going to go into issues that someone else may say, ah, boring, okay? Now, 1 John 5, 7, post it one more time from the NIV, okay? And then when you do that, post it from the King James back to back. Sorry about these. These issues come up. They're important. I gave you the link. I gave you the link to Theodore Letus's lecture, and where you'll find a YouTube cha channel that has other lectures that he did that you must listen to. This guy was a gift, an amazing man of God, right? That is a blessing to Christians because he makes these issues so clear that even someone like me, without any college background or theological training, can understand what the issues are and benefit. Okay. Now, let me find the notes. All right. First John 5, 7. There should be a note. Nope, there's no note here. Interesting. They don't even have a note anymore. Okay. Do you see the NIV, how it reads? First John 5, 7. For there are three that testify. That's it. Do you see how the NIV reads? There are three that testify. That's it. But wait, King James says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That verse has been <clears throat> rejected, removed, expunged, because scholars believe that 1 John did not contain this passage, that it was a later scribal insertion. Some scribe later on inserted that passage in his copy, and then it was added to subsequent copies. But the evidence of the Greek manuscript tradition, they'll tell you, shows that 1 John 5, 7 wasn't in the original letter that John wrote by inspiration. It was added and therefore should be rejected. Thank you, my God is Yahweh. You guys see now the difference between the King James and modern versions like the NIV that don't follow the same textual tradition? In respect to the way they read in 1 Timothy 3.16 and 1 John 5.7, you saw the difference? Right? 1 Timothy 3.16, King James says, God was manifest in the flesh. Modern versions, because they believe that these earlier findings, findings of earlier Greek uh, uh, papyri, don't have the word theos, God, but they have has or ho, right? And therefore... The more accurate reading, what Paul actually wrote is he was manifest in the flesh, 
And then you saw in case of 1 John 5, 7. Now, how does this tie in with Sir Isaac Newton? These were the passages that influenced Sir Isaac Newton to reject the doctrine of the Trinity. When he saw the variant readings and he saw that scholars are now saying 1 John 5, 7 wasn't part of what John originally wrote. It's an interpolation. It was added later on. And when he saw that the better manuscripts in his estimation and 1 Timothy 3.16 didn't read God was manifest in the flesh. That started him on a path of denying whether God is a trinity and whether Jesus is God. So he became a full-blown anti-Trinitarian Unitarian. And he wrote a monograph, or you can call it a book, on these two passages that you can find online, which was published originally anonymously because he didn't want to get fired from his position as a teacher if they found out he was an anti-Trinitarian, but then 30 years after his death, it was published with his name on it. You see what kind of coward he was? You see what kind of, the man that you guys praise, Sir Isaac Newton, you praise him. See, he was a Christian and he was a scientist. The father of modern physics was a diehard anti-Trinitarian. And he was such a coward, a man of no integrity. He was teaching at a Trinitarian college. And he hid his anti-Trinitarian beliefs from them so that when he did write this, he had someone translated in French anonymously, and it was only published with his name attached to it after he died. You with me there? Now, let me get you that lecture from Theodore Letus. Praise God for that man. He's now with the Lord Jesus. He's alive, entered his rest. But he's left behind a body of work. You need to listen to his lectures. Let me get it for you again. One more time so we can go into the session. All right? So we can go into the session. Listen to this lecture from beginning to end. He exposes the agenda, the influence of textual criticism on destroying the faith of many in respect to their belief in the Trinity and the deity of Christ, okay? But then subscribe to that channel, hit the like button on the videos, and listen to all his lectures. Don't just listen to this, okay? I wish he was around because only God knows the kind of research he'd be doing now, okay? There you go. Save that link. So this was in response to Davy's question. The primary reason why I'm sticking to the King James. I'm not dogmatic in the sense that if you don't follow the King James, I think you're a false Christian and you're not of the Lord. No, 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 no. I don't. No, no. My own conviction, why, what brought me to this point, my journey that brought me to this point is a long one. But basically, in a nutshell, Davies, let me just share you in a nutshell why. People are not going to be convinced of this and think, you know what? No, that's, you know, just bad argument, bad logic. That's fine. I'm telling you my conviction. My conviction. Are you ready for the answer? Because you asked me the question. Why have I come to the point where I believe, for now, the best English translation and the most accurate English translation of God's original <clears throat> preserved words happens to be the King James, right? Why I came to this position, here's part of it, Davies. Here's part of it. And I'm not saying this is going to convince you, but to me, this is what convinced me. To me, I'm at peace. I'm okay. This is my conviction. I know people are going to laugh at me, say, well, why can't you say that about some other version? I know. I've heard the arguments. And each position can make good points for their position, but there are objections that they can't answer. Each view has problems that they cannot adequately address. So here's my conviction. God was pleased to make the King James translation the chief translation for English-speaking Christians for over 300 years without any rival, so that all English-speaking churches were on the same page, using the same translation, quoting the same form of text, right, and the same form of passages, right, so that you knew... If someone in California is going to quote John 3.16 to you, he was going to quote it in the same way that you have it 
and the way you would quote it in Chicago, okay? Now, beyond that, besides God making this the chief English translation for English-speaking Christians the world over that spoke English, God was pleased that this translation would be based on those set of manuscripts and certain versions like the Latin Vulgate, which gave us readings such as 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, or 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And he permitted those readings to become part of the chief English-speaking translation for over 300 years and allowed Christians to cite these passages in those exact forms as thus saith the Lord. So if these passages were not original, were not part of what the original authors wrote, that means God allowed defective readings to be read aloud, to be preached on, to be believed in that were not part of his original <clears throat> manuscripts. Why did God allow that? You see my problem? You see my conviction? Why I came to that conviction? So I believe all the readings of the King James Bible based on Greek witnesses that they had and other versions like the Latin Vulgate, were the readings God wanted to be there in English preserved because those were the readings that God <clears throat> moved these Christians to include because they are original, what God inspired. That's my conviction, my position, my understanding. Now, can I refute every objection against my position? Of course not. But... The other side that disagrees, are there objections they can't address? Yes, there are many objections they cannot address. So either position has to deal with objections they cannot adequately address because we don't know all the issues, we don't know everything, and we don't have every copy of the Bible ever produced because there are many copies that deteriorated or were burned or destroyed. Right. By the way, Netta, to confirm what you said, I don't know if you remember it. In one of the previous sessions, I went to that Orthodox church, St. Halalambros. I'm sorry, man. I can't say that name. And I looked at their pews to see what English versions of the Bible. And I have the picture. They only had New King James Version and King James. Because this was an English-speaking Greek Orthodox church where the liturgy was in English. And the only two Bibles they had in English, King James and New King James. That's my conviction. Now, you're going to have people laughing at me, right? You're going to have my buddy Edward Dacor, Anthony Rogers, or James White laughing at me. Oh, what a stupid logic. Faulty logic, Sam. That's okay. If my logic is faulty, Holy Spirit saved me from all bad thinking, <clears throat> mistaken arguments, from all error and bad logic and sanctify me to think your thoughts after you for the glory of Jesus. That's my prayer. That's my trust, right? So if I'm wrong, my trust is the Holy Spirit will convict me. Yeah, Joel Glenn Davis, I do not I do not have a problem with that position, Joel Glenn Davis, because I can pick up the NIV and prove the core doctrines of the Christian faith. Heck, I'm, I've been doing it with the Jehovah Witness Bible, Joel Glenn Davis, right? I've even used this corrupt perversion of a Bible to prove the core doctrines of the Christian faith, right? Why? Because at the end of the day, Joel Glenn Davis, at the end of the day, the Greek manuscripts, let me say this so people don't misunderstand. There are differences, and some of the differences, it's only they estimate only less than 1% are very serious and viable, the term that Daniel Wallace uses. But for over 90% of the time, the Greek manuscripts agree. So over 90% of the time, English translations will agree because they're translating the same Greek, Greek text over 90% of the time. You with me there? Why do you think I can use the NIV to prove the Trinity, the deity of Christ, that God became flesh? The virginal conception and birth of Jesus Christ, his physical bodily resurrection, his physical bodily return. Because the NIV is translating 
a particular reconstructed Greek text that agrees over 90% of the time with the King James Version translation. Clear? Did I put you to sleep with all this? And I'm trusting the Spirit to save me from error. And if I'm mistaken, may he guard you from that. Reveal to me where I'm mistaken and correct it to me not to repeat it. That's truly my trust. Okay. I hope that answered your question somewhat. I hope you clicked on the link to Theodore P. Uh, Letus' lecture. Hit the like button. Listen to the lecture. Subscribe to that YouTube channel. Listen to all his lectures. I promise you. He'll blow you away with the wealth of information. The man was a scholar, and he exposed a lot of corruption behind the production of modern translations. You in there? You'll be blown away by the information. This stuff about Isaac Newton, I knew Isaac Newton was an anti-Trinitarian, but I did not know that Isaac Newton lost his faith in the Trinity because of variant readings. I didn't know that. I learned that from him. And he mentions other people who also lost their faith in the Trinity and the deity of Christ because of variant readings. Theodore Letus. Hold on, guys. Let me see who this is. Hello? Who's calling? Yes, what's going on? It should be in my email, but I'm not there now. I'm actually te teaching right now. So I'll try to get it to you guys. Probably tomorrow because I'm gone all day today. Sure, you got it. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. You ever interrupt me in a live session, I'll bust your face, you wicked sinner. You don't interrupt a live session. From a man who's the closest thing to infallibility, you little even evil rabid dog. Pit! There you go. See, I'm an equal opportunist. Sorry, guys. That was from my apartment complex, right? It's very complex. Apartment complex. They needed my information about the electricity. Right. Anyway. With that said, right? Darn you, you filthy dog. See, I call everybody a dog, and you're a dog too. How do you like that? You're foaming at the mouth. Someone needs to muzzle you, put you back in the cage you came out of, and your mother needs to go to jail for giving birth to a dog like you. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Thank you, first and last. Is it a coincidence Sir Isaac Newton is connected with electricity, and they call me about electricity? Is that that same demon that deceived Sir Isaac Newton? From turning his back on the Trinity. Also, the reason why someone called me about electricity. Hmm. Things to make you go, hmm. Right. Now, are you ready for John 1? Hopefully, this will be my final session on John 1, Lord willing, until we revisit it when I do a book by book, chapter by chapter, exposition of scriptures, trusting the Holy Spirit to teach me to do it accurately for the glory of Christ. Everyone there? By the way, first and last, how's your back feeling now? You feeling a little better, brother? Feeling a little better? Yeah. Hope you are. All right, with that said, let's unpack some more meat from John 1 so that we'll be done. I promise you guys, if you go back and re-listen to the multi-part series on John 1, you will now have ample exegetical contextual proof that John chapter 1, verses 118, introduced to us two eternal divine persons, God the Father, his eternal word, the Lord Jesus, both of whom are uncreated by nature, both of whom have always existed together in eternity as the one God. And that word then became flesh, right? So let's look at John 1, verse 14. John 1, verse 14. Now we're going into John 1. Thank you, Anetta, sister. God bless you. Yeah, we're just starting out because these are the issues. That's why hopefully when I start, we'll just go into the issue. But sometimes these other things need to be addressed to prepare people, right, for 
the main course by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, guide this conversation in Jesus' name. Here, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember, as I said that John 1 is an inspired exposition commentary on the Genesis account of creation. John 1 also is an inspired exposition on some of the major books and themes of the Old Testament. Folks, this is where I need you to listen, because you're going to see me here, right? Man, what happened? I lost 11 people already? Dude, what's up, man? Dave Boone keeps going higher, and I keep going lower. <laughs> anyway, now, folks, John 1, 14. John just gave you an inspired exposition of how to find Jesus in the Exodus, specifically in God's command to Moses to construct the temple. It wasn't called the temple. It was called the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. Are you guys ready now? Tabernacle, tent of meeting. John 1, 14, for a Greek reader, because John is written in Greek, who read the Old Testament in Greek, who read the Old Testament in Greek, he would have made a connection with what John said here about the word becoming flesh and the Exodus account of God telling Moses, construct a tabernacle called the Tent of Meeting where I would come down and meet you there. Okay? Come down and meet you there. Are you with me there? Are you ready for me to show you what, I'm, what am I talking about? That John 1.14 is pointing to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, that Moses constructed by command of God, so God would then meet him there in that tabernacle. It's all there in that word, dwelt among us. John 1.14, dwelt among us. Now, again, you don't need to know Greek. Just know how to navigate, let's say, your strong concordance or get a good commentary on someone who's reliable to tell you what the Greek implies, the nuance of the Greek term, or go to blueletterbible.org or biblehub.com, and there it gives you the Greek, the underlying Greek, and the lexical definition. Thank God for modern technology. All of this is free, one fingertip away. When I say free, as long as you pay for internet, it's free online. Here. I'm going to give you the link to Bible Hub's interlinear. Interlinear means it gives you the original words and the original language and their English translations. That's an interlinear. Okay, here. John 1, 14. Here's the link. You guys got to click on it. Here's the link. Stavros. All right. Click on it. You're going to see that the, the verb, right, and the word flesh became. K, or if you want to say it the Erasmian way, the way they teach you in America, Kai, Hologos, Sarx, Agenita, Agenitu. And there's the word. You see the word dwelt? Eskinosin. Eskinosin. Well, some will say Eskinosin. Do you see that word, that verb? Do you see it? Did you click on it to see it? Did everyone click? Because I can't go on any further if you don't confirm it for yourselves. That word dwelt, eskinosin. Eskinosin, Rasmian butchering of the Greek. Okay. I'm now going to click on <clears throat> the Strongs. Eskinosin comes from the verb skinao. Here you go. Skinao. There you go, right here. Guys, please follow me. Don't be distracted. Follow me. Focus for the glory of Jesus so you can see the meat of scriptures. There you'll see skenao, verb. Notice definition, to have one's tent, to dwell. Usage, I dwell as in a tent, in camp, have my tabernacle. Now, you look to your right, Englishman's concordance, right? It will give you the occurrences of the word. Notice in Revelation 7, 15, skino, skinose, skinose is rendered, and God who's on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. Okay? Do you see it? Did you, do you see the word skinao, eskinosin, means to pitch your tent, to pitch your tabernacle, to dwell in a tent, 
to dwell in a tabernacle. Tabernacle among others. Did everyone see that? Confirmation? I hope Daryl Nutt is still here because I'm going to answer your question. Everyone see that? See, Jay's getting it. Now it's sinking in, Jay. You see where I'm going with this? It says, when the word became flesh, that's when he pitched his tent, pitched his tabernacle, dwelt in a tent, in a tabernacle to tabernacle among us. I'm going to make sure enough of you are getting this. It's sinking in. You're learning. You're understanding. Who's not getting it? Anybody? Help me out, guys. Help me to help you. Help me to help you. Because this is going to destroy anti-Trinitarianism. Okay, good. Praise the Lord. You know why that word is so relevant? I don't know why it's buffering. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why it's buffering here. Sorry about that. It upsets me. When I buffer, I want to lose my testimony. Lord Jesus, save me from my own flesh. Okay. How's it going to be bad, Alvino, when I'm in a place that has top-notch internet? But thank you for your concern. You say that again. If you say my signal's bad, I'm going to signal you. Okay. Now, everyone with me here? You understand what it's saying? It's saying that when Jesus became flesh, he pitched his tent, his tabernacle among us. Why is that important? The verb skenao, right? The word skenao is the verbal form of skinne, of skinne. Okay. Skinao is the verbal form of skinne. Skinao is the verbal form. It's a verb, and verb means action, verbal form of the noun skinne. Do you know why that's important? Because in the Greek translation, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, when you look at Exodus and it talks about the tent of meeting, the word tent, the word tent, is skinne. When it says Moses pitched the tent, and that's the tent where he would meet God. God would come down in a pillar of cloud, and then he would speak to Moses in the tent. This is the tent that God would enter to speak to Moses face to face. Exodus 33, verses 7 to 11. Exodus 33, verses 7 to 11. And I'm going to give you the English translation of the Greek version of the Old Testament. So you can see the Greek word skinne with your own eyes. But Exodus 33, 7 to 11, right? Watch here. As our brother posted. We're waiting for the rapture. Hold on. Let me get it. 33. Okay, let's read. And Moses took the tabernacle. Folks, guess what the Greek word for tabernacle is? is? Skinne. He took the tabernacle. Greek word skinne from where we get skinao. And pitched it without the camp. Afar off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. Now watch here. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord, Jehovah, everyone wanted to inquire of God, went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation. Guess what the word tabernacle in Greek is? You're going to see it. I'm going to show it to you. Skinne, which was without the camp. And it came to pass that when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, Greek word, skinne, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. So he entered inside the tabernacle, the skinne. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, watch what came down, right? The cloudy pillar. Stand at the tabernacle. I'm sorry. The cloudy pillar descended, stood at the door of the tabernacle, and Jehovah talked with Moses. And all the people saw the. What do we have here? Why is your internet buffering, bro? Okay. Did you catch it? Exodus 33 10, right? people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door 
And Jehovah spake unto Moses face to face directly, right? As a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Okay, did you catch what happened? Moses pitched a tabernacle, Greek word skin a, entered the tabernacle. The pillar of cloud came down, and God was in the pillar, came down to the door so he can meet Moses in the tent and speak to him directly. Did you catch it? Now, here is the link to the English translation of the Greek. Okay. Scroll down to verse 7 of Exodus 33. When you look to the Greek, you're going to see this. Uh, skinen. Skinen. That's the accusative of skine. Here it is, guys. Watch. That's what you're going to see. If you read Greek, you can see it. Transliterate. Skinen. Skin in. You understand what you just read? Yes, Matthew George. That's where they got the belief that Jehovah's the cloud rider, not Baal, not Baal, the false god. Okay. Did you understand what you just read? The word skine, from which we get the verb skinao, is the very Greek noun used to translate the Hebrew word temple, tabernacle, tent which God had Moses construct because that would be the place that God would enter and meet Moses and speak to him directly. Who didn't get it? And then thank first last for putting the Greek for us. Kai or K, Lambon, Moses, Ten or Tin, Skinin, Autu. Are enough of you guys following me? Because not all of you are responding. So I don't know if who I'm losing, who's not getting it, who doesn't care. Who's not getting it? Good. Praise God. If you're in awe and blown away and that's why you're silent, hallelujah. May the Holy Spirit increase your awe and blow you even more away of how real God is and that this is his word. Okay. Now, let's go to another example. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Another example. And again, I'm going to give you the link to the English translation, the Greek version of the Old Testament, so you can confirm this for yourself. Okay? Let's read. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The cloud covered the tent. Of the congregation, guess what the word tent is in Greek? Skine. And the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. Wow, right there you should be blown away. Two things. The tent, skine, and the cloud filled it, entered the tent, filled it. And when the cloud filled it, that was God's glory filling it. So the tent, skine, was filled with the glory of Jehovah. Because we're not sure I'm going to go with this. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, Greek word skine, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Jehovah the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and fire. It appeared as fire to give them light was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Now here, folks, the English translation of the Greek, when you go to verse 34, see if you can tell me what the Greek word for tent tabernacle happened to be. Here you go, right here with your own eyes confirming this. Did I give you? Well, the versification seems to be different. I don't know why. Anyway, the versification is different, but if you go down, it starts here in verse 28. Their versification is different. So in the English version of the Greek, it's verse 28. And the cloud covered the tabernacle. And here it is. Here's the Greek words. In front of your eyes, right there. Start at 28. Cain or ten. Uh, skinin or skinane or skinane. Do you see it? And he posted it for us. Thank you for his last. Kai, 
के एकलुप्सिन हे नेफेला दैट्स द ग्रीक वर्ड फॉर फॉर क्लाउड नेफेला टेन स्किने टू मार्टुरियो मीनिंग द टेंट ऑफ विटनेस द टैबरनेकल ऑफ विटनेस ओके थैंक यू जो वो विटनेस इंटरलीनर फॉर टीचिंग मी हाउ टू रीड द ग्रीक even though i'm butchering its pronunciation okay now folks did you just read that jehovah's glory filled the skene the tabernacle the tent the cloud that appeared visibly which turned to fire at night was the visible sign to israel god was with them because he was in the cloud by day which appeared as fire by night the cloud came down to the temple and then jehovah filled the temple with his glory now let's put exodus 30 i'm sorry exodus 40 verse 34 back to back with john 114 do me a favor now protestant post exodus 40 verse 34 with john 114 let's see if you make the connection Watch here. Now you're seeing, Jay. See if you make the connection. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The cloud covered the skene of the congregation, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt skenao eskenosin, and pitched his tent among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you see the connection? and as andrew said i discussed this in previous sessions but some of you have to hear this over and over again until it becomes second nature you understand what you just read you understand what john just did not only is john an inspired exposition of the creation account of genesis and showing you where jesus fits he's also showing you how the tabernacle that moses constructed points to jesus what john just told you is that the flesh body that Jesus took when Jesus took flesh a physical body of flesh he made that physical body of flesh the very tent the very temple the very tabernacle of God so the one living in that tent is God and that tent is now filled with the fullness of the glory of God that's what John just told you about the physical body of Jesus Everyone got it? Who didn't get it? You understand what you just read in John 1:14? If you read context and know John is getting an inspired commentary on where Jesus fits in the Old Testament and how it all points to him. You seen it? I wanted the minute to sink in. The tent that Moses constructed, the noun in Greek is skene. It was filled with the glory of God, where God appeared visibly in a cloud by day, which appeared as fire by night. Okay. Then John says, "Hey, you guys, remember that tent in the Old Testament? Yeah. Do you know God has now pitched a new tent? God has constructed a new temple in which He dwells in, and He fills it with His fullness and the fullness of His glory. Really, John? Where is that tent?" the physical body of Jesus that you nailed to the cross that he now raised immortal in other words when you nailed the physical body of Jesus to the cross when you whipped the physical body of Jesus to the point that he almost died and you beat the physical body of Jesus and you hit the human face of Jesus you were destroying the very physical temple of the living god and the god that was dwelling in it is none other than the man of nazareth jesus christ you caught it now now it helps you appreciate what jesus says in john 2 19 to 22 john 2 19 to 22 john 2 19 to 22 yep thank you andrew And again as Andrew remembers good recall I did this session not too long ago but it's good we need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature 
and it sinks in. We can recall it by the power of the Spirit to share. Folks, can you imagine if you learn all these arguments and you start sharing it in your churches, in your Bible studies, in your groups, and sharing in your witness? How many people will be blown away? How many Christians will be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit using you to show them this is God's word and the God of this Bible is real? But you got to learn it, absorb it, share it, and teach it. John 2, 19 to 22. Exactly, by the power of the Holy Spirit medic. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple. And he was in Jerusalem in the temple cleansing it. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. In three days, I will raise up the temple you destroy. I'll do it. But they thought he's not about the building. Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building. And wilt thou, you, rear it up in three days? You're going to raise it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Bam! When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Do you see what Jesus just called this physical body? You're going to destroy this temple, but I will raise it up immortal in three days. Jesus just said, this physical body in your midst is the very temple of the living God who lives in it. But hold on, Jesus, who's living in it? You are. It's your body. Yes. So you're the God in the temple. Yes. You're the God who's living in the temple. Yes. So is my Father dwelling in me and the Spirit. Wow. Second in. Before I move on, sinking in. Now, here's what, well, hold on, I'm not going to go there yet. Let me show you another thing. Do you remember in the tabernacle, the tent, it said the cloud filled, right, the place, and the cloud descended in front of the tent? You remember that? You remember that, right? We read it just a few moments ago. Now notice the other connection. Mark 9, verse 7, Matthew 17, verse 5. Mark 9, verse 7, Matthew 17, verse 5. Here's the other connection. Mark 9, verse 7, Matthew 17, verse 5. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Whoa! Just like the cloud descended upon the tent in the, eye, in the eyes of Moses in front of Israel, the cloud now descends upon Jesus and his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they see the cloud and hear a voice audibly from the cloud telling the three, this one standing before you is my son whom I love. Listen to him. <whistles> Thank you, Matthew George. You nailed it perfectly. John knew his Old Testament so well with the understanding of the size of Revelation. Not only John knew it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul knew it, Matthew knew it, Mark knew it, Luke knew it. You caught it now? Folks, can I ask you a question? Whose voice did they hear audibly on that mountain in the earth? Who descended visibly in a cloud that they saw with their physical eyes? Whose voice they heard audibly from the mountain? And who appeared in a cloud, a cloud that they saw visibly with their eyes? The Father. Who told you the Father cannot appear in time and space, cannot appear visibly, and cannot be heard audibly? Right there, you saw it. That wasn't Jesus in the cloud. We're not modalists. That was the Father in the cloud. He descended in the cloud. The cloud appeared visibly. They saw the cloud, and they heard the voice audibly. That means the Father had now manifested visibly to them. Sink it in. Sinking in. Yep, I do need water. Sorry. 
we'll get it a little bit. What's up, handsome? I need some water, player. If you can get it. You got it, Jay. And Jay, you want to be blown away? The cloud descended upon Jesus while he was on a mountain. Just like when the cloud descended on the mount of God, and Moses went up the mountain and in the cloud. Jay, let me make a further connection with you. Are you ready? Exodus 24, 9 to 18. Exodus 24, 9 to 18. Guys, let me make another question because Jay mentioned it. Watch here. Exodus 24, 9 to 18. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. Guys, pay attention. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet. So they got, saw God appear visibly. They saw visible feet and what looked like pavement under his feet. They saw under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. So they saw God writing something that looked like a you know sapphire stone. Pavement. And as it were the body of heaven in its clearness, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God. See, the text repeats it, so you don't miss it. They're seeing God, the God of Israel, not some creature. And then he didn't drink. Now watch this. Folks, pay attention. The honor that God gives Moses alone. They saw God visibly. They could see his feet and pavement under his feet. But that's as far as they could go. Moses went further. Look how far Moses went and was allowed to go because he was God's friend whom God loved and spoke directly to. Pay attention from verse 12. And Jehovah the Lord said unto Moses, come up to me into the mount. So they're seeing me at the foot of the mountain down there. You're going to get closer. You're going to come up to the mount inside the cloud and you're going to be with me in the cloud, Moses. Right? Come up to me into the mount. And be there, and I'll give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us. Wait here, because you can't come any closer. Until we come, on, come again unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up. Pay attention. Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. Get ready to be blown away. Okay? And the glory of Jehovah abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. Moses had to wait there six days. And only entered on the Sabbath, the seventh day. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So he heard a voice audibly. And they're hearing the voice audibly. And notice, folks, this is now taking place in actual time and space on earth. It's not a dream or a vision. It's God actually entering into the earth visibly, and they're hearing the voice audibly. Okay? Now watch. <clears throat> and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of Jehovah was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of Israel. So because they're at a distance, all they saw was a cloud and fire. That's all they could see. They didn't see anything else. Now watch. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Did you guys catch it? He went into the cloud. So notice the entire nation of Israel. They see the mountain from afar. They see the cloud visibly. They see what looks like fire. They hear the voice audibly. And then they see Mount Moses going up. And in the seventh day, he entered the cloud, and he's in the cloud for 40 days and 40 nights. For 40 days and 40 nights, Moses is allowed to live with God in the cloud and speak to God face to face. But when? On the seventh day, right? It says, after six days, on the seventh day, right? Right? You read it. I don't need to repeat it, right? Okay, let's connect it with Jesus. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. Exactly, Riaz. And thank you for your support. M Matthew 17, verses 1 to 5. Guys, watch this. Thank you, Nada. That's because of the Holy Spirit. And after six days, wait, 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 guys. When did the cloud descend upon Jesus, Peter, James, and John when they went to the mount? After six days on the seventh day. 
When did Moses enter the cloud that had descended upon the mount? On the seventh day. <whistles> After six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine like Moses' face shone after entering into the cloud and being in God's glorious presence, right? Jesus is now shining on a high mountain. And when does the cloud come down upon them? On the seventh day. When does Moses enter the cloud? On the seventh day. And who appears? Moses and Elijah. Surprise, surprise. The very Moses who also entered the cloud on a high mountain on the seventh day and shone with the illumination of God. Did you catch it? Moses enters the cloud on the seventh day after descending on a high mountain to be with God face to face. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on the seventh day to a high mountain. Moses appears. Elijah appears. God the Father himself appears. And that cloud that now overshadowed them on the seventh day, and they heard the voice of God the Father audibly. You catching it? And in doing it, God the Father is showing his son is worthy of much more glory, greater glory than Moses and Elijah. Why? Why? Because God never came down on the mount in a cloud and told Israel, Moses is my son. Moses is my servant. And Jesus is so great and so worthy of honor it wasn't enough for Moses and Elijah to show up and minister to him. As a sign to the apostles, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And we're all pointing to him. All we did and said was about him. But God the Father himself comes down to give Jesus honor. No, no, Mickey, you're still not getting it. No, 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 Mickey, I just corrected it. More than a prophet, because the father didn't say, this is my servant. He said, this is my beloved son. You understand what God just did for his son, Jesus? The father just did for his son, Jesus? You know what he just did? Moses shows up because God sent him. Moses, go and give honor to my son in front of Peter, James, and John, so they can see that my son is greater than you. Elijah, you're a prophet. You represent the prophets. You too appear visibly so that Peter, James, and John can know who this one is before them. So Moses and Elijah represents the law and the prophets. And in front of James, John, and Peter, they're basically saying, it's all about him. All we did and said and wrote was in reference to him. We were pointing to him. But that's still not enough. Jesus is worthy of even greater glory. God the Father himself comes down visibly in a cloud and says, you know how special he is? I personally come down to bear witness and testify to you three. This is my son whom I love. My heart, listen to him. Everyone getting it now or no? Did it sink in? Clear? Okay. You see what's going on in the Gospel of John? Amen, Jay. And you see how John is showing you all of the Old Testament is about Jesus. You need to find him everywhere in the Old Testament. In the creation account, in the story of Adam and Eve, in the story of Abraham and Isaac, in the story of Moses and the Exodus and the tabernacle. Right? All of it is about him. All of it is about him. That's John's theme. And Matthew, Mark, Luke all agree. And they see Jesus everywhere. Wow, that points to Jesus. Wow, that's a sign of Jesus. Jesus is everywhere because it's all about him. And if you don't believe me, let's see what Jesus says in John 5, 39 and 40. Exactly, Jay. John 5, 39 40. From Jesus himself, look what he says. John 5, 39 and 40. 
Search the scriptures. Guys, pay attention. Look what Jesus said. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you may have life. See what Jesus said? The scriptures that you're studying, if you study them correctly, it will all bring you to me. Because all of it is about me. They're all bearing witness of me. And then notice what he says about Moses. John 5, 45, 47. John 5, 45 to 47. Do not think that I will accuse you be, to the Father. Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For if ye had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Bam, there you go. You got it? And is it ironic? Make sure you get the patterns of evidence, the Red Sea Crossing documentary that was aired last week in Fathom that's going to be on DVD. I watched it. And make sure you get the other two DVDs in the series, Patterns of Evidence, the Exodus, and Did Moses Write the Torah? Because in that documentary on Moses writing the Torah, this is what was interesting to me. And I need you to listen here. The producer of the documentary who appears in the film interviewed archaeologists and scholars who became agnostic, if not atheist, because of the wrong dating assigned to the Exodus. See, a lot of scholars believe the Exodus, according to the Bible, was supposed to have taken place in 13th century BC, 1200s. Because of that dating, archaeologists have yet to find any corroborating archaeological proof from the Sinai region or from Egypt that confirms a mass of people leaving Egypt. Now, if you push it to an earlier date, 15th century BC, you see massive amounts of textual and archaeological evidence confirming the existence of Joseph, of Israel's presence in Avarice, which is Ramesses, in Goshen, and for the plagues, and for a mass exit of people. But put that aside. Let's put that aside. When he interviewed these liberal scholars and archaeologists, do you know why they lost their faith? One of them was the son of a minister. In fact, the ones he interviewed were raised in conservative Christian homes that were taught the Bibles of God's word. All of them became agnostic, if not atheist. They all lost their faith in Christianity. Do you know why? And they're all experts on, let's say, Exodus or Egyptology. Do you know why they all lost their faith? It's in, it's in the documentary. Do you know why? Once they were convinced that the Torah doesn't give you actual history, that the Exodus didn't happen, that Moses may not have existed, and the plagues didn't give up, they lost faith in all of the Bible. It even destroyed their faith in Christianity. That's exactly what Jesus just said, confirming what Jesus just said. Let's reread what Jesus just said. He says, if you don't believe Moses, what he wrote, you won't believe me. They lost faith in Moses, that Moses wrote the Torah, that the Exodus happened, that Moses may have not existed. He may have been a fictional character. Maybe there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once they lost their faith in the writing of Moses and the Exodus as an historical event, they lost their faith in Jesus. And Jesus said that. Notice here, he said it himself. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For he, if for had ye believed Moses, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe, believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Exactly. They no longer believe the writings of Moses. They no longer believe that an historical Moses wrote the Pentateuch. They even questioned whether he existed. They saw no evidence for an exodus. They started doubting Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, everything written in the law of Moses. Once they doubted that, they gave up on Christianity.
Rebel, let me just confirm. If you go with the 15th century BC data, the amount of evidence for this diversity of Joseph and Israel and Egypt and Goshen and Moses and the Exodus, overwhelming. But because of liberal scholarship and their refusal to date the Exodus to 15th century BC, they just ignore the evidence. But Rabul and everyone else, praise the triune God, praise your Lord, my Lord Jesus, that he raises up solid men of integrity to uncover these historical archaeological proofs and make them known to the masses to save us from this wicked satanic deception of liberals who ignore the data, don't even talk about the data, don't care for the data, destroying the faith of many. Because King Jesus is alive, he is risen, he is almighty over creation and over Satan and his children, and he will raise up witnesses to protect us. Freddie Rocco. The reason why they're trying to date the Exodus to 13th century BC is because Exodus mentions the city of Ramesses. Well, the city of Ramesses did not exist at the time of the traditional dating of Moses, 16th century BC. This was something that was later on. So they believe that the Exodus must have occurred after Ramesses was Pharaoh. But there's a good reason why the name of a later pharaoh would be introduced in Exodus, even though when Moses left Egypt, Ramesses wasn't born, he wasn't the pharaoh. Because you'll find in the Pentateuch what's known as editorial updating, where Israelites go back to the Torah and change certain place names by the names that they were known at a later date. That still doesn't refute the fact Moses originally wrote the bulk of the Torah, but later on they made some editorial updates to it to specific place names so that later generations would know where this location was by the name known to them at a later time. You get my point? But they take the reference to Ramesses in Exodus 111 to mean, see, Ramesses must have been Pharaoh. And this, is, this must have taken place after Ramesses. No, no, no. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means that the older form of the Torah, right, was updated later on. And the name of that location was changed to reflect what that name became known to a later generation. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. I, I came from Chicago. Now watch this example. So there's an easy response to that, but they don't want to accept it. No, we don't accept it. Why? If you accept this, that this is later editorial updating, then all the evidence confirms the Exodus. The 15th century BC date lines up perfectly, shouting in your face, the Exodus happened, the God of Moses is real. But they won't. They won't budge. But let me give you a, a modern example. You ready? Let me give you a modern example, what I mean. Let's say uh, I talk to you guys and say, hey, did you know 400 years after the time of Jesus Christ, there was a great slaughter of native Indians in Chicago? And in Des Plaines, a suburb of Chicago, 10,000 Indians were slaughtered. Now, some say, wait, 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 wait. 400 years after Christ, it wasn't called Chicago, and there was no suburb called Des Plaines. And my response would be, I know that, stupid. I'm not saying it was called Chicago. I'm call, I'm letting you know that this is the area in which this took place. And I'm giving you the name that you know this area by. Hello, moron. You get my point? You put me there? So just because Ramesses and the city of Ramesses is mentioned in Exodus 111 and other parts of the Torah doesn't mean the Torah could not have been written before Ramesses was born and before Ramesses was Pharaoh. It simply means that a later generation of Israelites made some editorial updates to certain place names so that the people reading the Torah later would know where these places happened to be by the names that they became known by at that time. Making sense?
Yeah, in fact, here, thank you, grateful to Jesus. How many times have you heard people say, Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jew or Palestinian Judaism? Wait, was it called Palestine at the time of Jesus? So Jesus went around saying, I'm a Palestinian Jew? No, dummy. That, that land, which is called Palestine today, even though it was called Israel at the time of Jesus or Judea, were you referring to it by its modern moniker? So yes, he's a Palestinian Jew, meaning he's a Jew from that area we call Palestine today. Exactly. Right? You get my point now, right? Did I lose anyone? Or did this bless you? Did this encourage you? This that illuminated you? This enlighten you to see how beautiful, how deep, how majestic, how glorious God's word, the Holy Bible is, right? The perfect word of God and the God of this Bible is real. Jesus is alive. He is life. And without him, we could not exist, right? And how irrefutably clear the biblical evidence for the Trinity is to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. If you're dead in sin or ensnared by the devil, or tradition has taken you captive, then even if the sun shines, shines before your face, right? If you're blind, you can see, I don't see the sun. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Okay. With that said, let me now tell you why interpreting John 1 is vitally important. John 1, verses 1 to 18 is known as the prologue of John. Thank you, Rebel. Thank you all. God bless you for your love and support and prayers. Pray Jesus keeps me miraculously safe, my daughters and I, to protect us, that he'll keep them healthy and see me, <clears throat> use me to see them grow up to be godly women and provide abundantly for their needs and provide through me to raise them to be godly women, to be in my life sooner than later. Please, Lord Jesus, please. Now, let me explain to you why John chapter 1, verses 118, called the prologue of the gospel of John, is vitally important. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, is John's inspired lens through which you are to read the rest of John. Guys, this is where you're going to learn how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible, specifically the Gospel of John. Okay, here's where I, if you guys are serious students of the Bible, want to understand the Bible correctly, interpret it correctly, and then live it out by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus to show him that we love him, listen to this, please. The first 18 chapters of chapter 1 of the Gospel of John is called the prologue. This is John's way of introducing all the themes, the major themes of the Gospel that he's writing by inspiration. And it's John's lenses given to us by the Spirit through him. He's saying, here, put these lenses on because you can't see clearly without these lenses these lenses were given to me by the Spirit so you can properly understand what I'm writing by inspiration so you can interpret correctly and avoid misinterpreting it. You with me there? You will know that you're misinterpreting John when you interpret a passage that contradicts his prologue. Okay? You will know you are getting John wrong when you interpret a verse in John that goes against the prologue, okay? I've already established in these sessions, you need to re-listen to these sessions, that John has begun his gospel by introducing two eternal divine persons, God and his word, Father and the Son. And he affirms that these two persons eternally existed with each other in intimate, perfect love and communion. These two uncreated persons existed together as God in nature, and these two persons together created the entire creation. And one of those persons, the Word, entered the world that he created to become a flesh and blood human being to save it from its darkness. Okay, you with me there? Everyone with me there? What does that mean? That means anytime you take a passage from John, that contradicts what the prologue says, you're misinterpreting John. For example, anytime you quote to me John 14, 28, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I, and say, you see, Jesus isn't God. Jesus is a creature. You know you just misinterpreted John 14, 28,
because John began his prologue by telling you Jesus is the pre-human word who is eternal by nature, who is uncreated, who existed in eternity, and he existed in eternity as God, and he's the one who created all things and gives life to all things. How dare you then misinterpret John 14, 28 to teach that Jesus is a creature when that contradicts what the prologue says about Jesus? You get my point? Thank you, stay true. You see why the prologue and its proper understanding interpretation are vitally important and how to understand the rest of John? Right? Another example. When you come to me and you quote John 17, 3, this is eternal life, Jesus praying, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see? Jesus said the Father is only true God, so he's not. He's a creature. You know you just misinterpreted Jesus' words because John began the gospel by saying that Jesus who prayed that prayer, that's the eternal word who has been existing eternally, who was existing before all creation, who was existing eternally as God in nature, who was existing eternally in fellowship with God, who created all things and gives life to all things. How dare you then misinterpret his words to mean He's not God, but a creature. You see my point? Everyone got it? Do you not understand why a proper understanding, interpretation of the prologue, are vitally important to correctly interpret John the way the Holy Spirit meant it to be interpreted and understood. And once you do that, there is no way you can use John to prove that Jesus is a creature because John has gone out of his way in the prologue to say, before creation, in eternity, two persons existing together eternally. Two persons always existing eternally. One of whom then entered the world to become flesh. So how dare you then undermine everything I said in the prologue about Jesus being uncreated, eternal, God Almighty, different from the Father, but one with the Father in essence, the creator of all things, who gives life to all things, who became flesh. How then do you take anything else I say after this to then misinterpret it to contradict how I began my gospel? You with me there? And so guess what I'm going to do, God willing, tomorrow, Saturday, if you're interested. If you're interested. Tomorrow, Saturday, I can do a special live stream on how the prologue of John demonstrates conclusively Jesus Christ died on the cross to procure the salvation of every creature in the world, not just the elect. Now, this is going to trouble some of my Calvinist friends whom I love dearly, my brothers, sisters in Christ. But if you're interested, I can show you how the prologue definitely shows that Jesus died for every human creature, even those who reject him, to procure their salvation if they accept it by faith, right? And not just the elect. With me there? Even though I used to be a five-point Calvinist and I have brothers and sisters who love Jesus who are Dear soldiers of Christ, more brilliant than I, like Edward Dalcor, Anthony Rogers, James White, I'm just going to share you my conviction, how the prologue of John impacted me in such a way that I couldn't hold to particular redemption. And we have a brother here who's a Calvinist. I love you, brother, so you can disagree with me. That's fine, Jay. I'm not here to convince you of my position. I want you to just hear me out, take what I have to say, Prayerfully go over it, ask the Spirit to show you where I'm wrong, and then keep believing what the Spirit wants you to believe. And I trust the Spirit to correct me to show me where I'm wrong. But if you're interested, I'll do it tomorrow, God willing. What tomorrow? I'll... Let's shoot for, well, it depends on when, first and the last, and Protestant believer are free tomorrow. What's your schedule looking like tomorrow? 
Protestant believer in first and last. What's your schedule look like uh, tomorrow? Is uh, 4 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time okay for you guys? That's Canadian time. Ken Swiss here. Let me give you real quickly. I'm going to give you because you just said that. John 1, 10 to 11, real quickly. Okay, this is a foretaste of tomorrow. John 1, 10 to 11. Okay, foretaste for tomorrow. And I'm going to unpack it tomorrow. I don't have time because i got to shut down. Go watch here. Protestant believer, let me know what your schedule is like tomorrow, Lord willing. And what I'll do is I will then schedule schedule my talk for tomorrow, tonight, to give people advance notice to show up, God willing. But the Protestant believer, the spear, I think he left me behind. I can't find him anymore. What happened to you, bro? You, you disappeared? Okay. Let me try to get John 1, 10 to 11. Okay. All right, we'll talk about it. But John, can you put John 1, 10, 11, Protestant believer? Because here, Kent's Dut Denwig. Bro, you better change your name because I ain't going to be calling you Kent's Dust Denwig. It's like Swahili. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Okay. Question number one. When it says he was in the world, and the world was made by him. Now, this is talking about the physical earth, right? It's talking about the earth that he entered, where humanity dwells, where mankind dwells, right? Where mankind dwells. He entered... The world of humanity, where human beings dwell. Are you with me there? Jesus won't curse me because I'm under the blood of Jesus. But if you're a filthy dog of the devil, he curse you for cursing his children. The children that Jesus purchased for his father. Okay, now, guys, when it says he was in the world and the world was made by him. It's talking about the world of humanity, where human beings dwell. He entered into the world of human beings. And it says it was made by him. Can I ask you a question? Does that exclude any human creature? When it says, and the world was made by him, is anyone excluded from that? Anyone omitted? Anyone omitted? Every human being that dwells in the earth was created by him. So when it says he entered the world, he came into the world of humanity where human beings dwell, and all the human beings that he made. But now here's my question, John 1, 11. John 1, 11. It says, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Can I ask you a question? Kins was dunt, however you pronounce your name. Who are his own that rejected him? He came unto his own and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. Who are these ones that he came to who rejected him? And I'll talk about John 1.10 and the world later on tomorrow, God willing. Right? Tomorrow, God willing. In light of John 3.16. I'm waiting for Kin Swoos Duke to respond. How do you pronounce his name? I guess he's not responding. He went silent. All right. Okay, his creation. No, no. It says he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. Not there, it's not his creation, but even if you say he came to his creation, I thought Jesus only comes to save the elect. So when it says he came to his own, it means he came <clears throat> for the elect, but the elect cannot reject him. But whoever these people are, they did reject him. So why would he come to people who rejected him if his intention was only to come to save the elect? You get my point? Why is he coming to those who are set to be his own when his own reject him if he only comes to save the elect and only the elect are his? But that's nothing. That's nothing. No, 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 no. That's nothing, Chris. Wait till I go into John 1.10, John 3.16. But Jay, even on your view, he doesn't come for all the children of Israel, only the elect from among them, right? And the elect from among them won't reject him, right, Jay? Even on your view. Because remember, I used to believe in particular redemption. Maybe I didn't understand it, right? So even coming to the children of Israel, he didn't come 
for all of them. He came only for the elect. But Jay, read John 111 one more time. It says, those that he came for and came to his own rejected him. But the elect will not reject him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. So he doesn't come to the not elect according to this view. He only comes to the elect, for the elect, to save the elect, and the elect will come to him. But it says he came to his own, those who were his, they rejected him. So it cannot mean the elect alone. If this whet your appetite, God willing, watch what I do tomorrow, Lord Jesus willing. Who's interested in me using the prologue of John to show that the gospel of John is clear? Jesus didn't come just to save the elect. He died to procure the salvation of every creature that he made, even those who reject him. And it's not 1 Timothy 10, verse 4. It's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Grateful to Jesus and thank the Lord that you're grateful to Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. He's Jehovah Almighty in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. And shamefully, we love you imperfectly. Give us the power to love you perfectly. And the power to be holy and, and pure. Save us from our flesh, from sin, from Satan in the world. And Father, in Jesus' name, save my children and I. Arise for us. Provide for us. Keep me safe here. Keep me away from that state and that woman. Deal with her. And have mercy upon the mother of my children. Convict her. Be a fire in heart to fall before the feet of Jesus and save her for your glory, Father. And please provide for this work to do ministry, to take care of my children. Please, Father. If you want me in ministry, Lord, then it's your gracious provision through your people that keeps us going. We need you, Father. You don't need us. We need you, Lord Jesus. You don't need us. We need you, Holy Spirit. You don't need us. And my daughters need you. Their children need you, our listening. Their loved ones need you. We all need you. Never leave nor forsake us, but cover us with the blood of Jesus and seal us by the spirit of life and use us to glorify you. We love you, Abba. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we pray you come sooner than later. Modern author, in Jesus' name. Father, have mercy. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. In Jesus' name. Take care, guys. Lord willing, tomorrow we'll try to shoot for around 7 p.m. Between 7 and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's Canadian time, New York time. 7, 8 p.m. Okay? God willing. Take care.